Governor David Patterson, thanks so much for joining us this week. Dan, it's good to talk to you again. So before we get to what's in the book, I just wanted to ask you, why now? You've been out of office for 10 years since you were governor. What prompted the book? You know, Dan, I was governor at one of the toughest times in the state's history. I just thought that I was mistreated often. And so when I came out of office and I thought about writing, if I had written then, it would have uh, demonstrated some ill feeling and score settling. Now I can actually look back and laugh at those times. I actually really wrote the book more for myself, uh, just to have it for myself and friends and family that wanted to read it. But then when they did read some of the stories, they uh, uh, encouraged me to, to put it out as a book. So the title of the book is Black, Blind, and In Charge, and you start the book with this really detailed uh, description of what was happening when you became governor, what was happening with former Governor Elliot Spitzer, and the actual day of that you got the call that you were going to be the next governor of New York State. Just give our viewers a little preview. What were you feeling in that exact moment where you were called by an aide to Governor Spitzer, the aide was in the governor's bathroom, and he was telling you the governor's going to resign that day? What was going through your head? So Dan, I know you've seen the, those movies where the protagonist, the main character, things are happening, and you, the observer, can see it, but the main character doesn't know it's happening. And so I felt that way because there were little hints during the day that something was wrong, but I wasn't picking up on them because I just wasn't, you know, thinking anything could be too wrong. Then all of a sudden, five minutes after one, the secretary of the governor, Richard Baum, calls me and he's calling me from the governor's bathroom, ironically. And I didn't know that for a few months. And he's whispering something about a prostitution scandal. And they texted my uh, uh, chief of staff, Charles O'Byrne, who comes up to my office to explain to me that I'm not getting what they're trying to tell me. But as soon as I opened the door, and even with my limited vision, I was about a foot away from Charles, and he was beat red. So I knew something far more serious was happening. And that's how I found out. And actually, the governor was going to resign at 2.15 that day. But he actually didn't, because his wife forbid him to do it and took her a few days to recognize that he couldn't go on as governor. And that gave me a couple of days to put together an inauguration speech because had it not been the case, I would have had to have spoken to New Yorkers about my new administration off the top of my head. You know, kind of in that same context, you write a little bit about some interactions that you had with Donald Trump, obviously before he was president, um, while you were governor, um, namely around the subject of your lieutenant governor, Richard Ravitch. And I'm wondering, based on those conversations and any other times that you talk to him, because the way that you write about him in some parts of the book is actually uh, quite nice. He, uh, the interactions that you've had with him down at Mar-a-Lago, for example. Um, I'm wondering how you felt about Donald Trump back then, and if you ever got the sense that he had these political ambitions to be the world's leader of democracy, the, the president of the United States. Well, everybody says Donald Trump is not a uh, politician. He's really a businessman. But as a politician, he's brilliant. And what uh, he did with me when I came in and everyone's critiquing me and, uh, uh, you know, calling me the accidental governor and all these types of things, Donald Trump calls me up and says, you're doing a great job. You had some issues you had to address. You got right up and told the public that. And that's the end of it. Move on. Don't let these people bother you. Uh, Donald Trump could sell ice to the Eskimos. But in terms of my interaction with him, uh, except for the fact that he um, told the Associated Press that I wish I had never taken Richard Ravitch in the first place after Ravitch made a mistake one day. And then when I called Donald Trump to tell him, why would you say that? I never said that to you. He said, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Look me in the eye and tell me that it's not the truth. I said, Donald, I can't look you in the eye. We're on the phone. <laughs> in addition to that, um, I'm just going to give you the courtesy that you didn't give me. I'm going to make a public statement that Richard Ravitch is, uh, made a mistake, he's accounted for it, and I never said that I wish I hadn't taken it. Well, Donald Trump, who had been totally supportive of me for two years up to that point, winds up on the Sean Hannity show a few days later, and when asked about a question, it's something to do, with, nothing to do with New York, goes, and another problem is that New York governor, he has no guts, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's incompetent, they never should have taken him in the first place. <laughs> You know, just along that same vein, 10 years later, we have Donald Trump versus Andrew Cuomo, who is obviously the current governor of the state. 
And like you said earlier, uh, you did something that a lot of governors don't do in the state of New York, and that is cut the budget. You were facing this huge deficit in the middle of the Great Recession. You alleviated a more than $20 billion deficit. It was quite a large amount. And now here, 10 years later, we're facing a huge deficit again here in New York because of the coronavirus. If you could speak to Andrew Cuomo, I know that you obviously could, but if you had some words of advice for him, what would you tell him about getting out of this mess? Well, I think that the governor has really handled this whole pandemic crisis brilliantly. And he's made some of the other leaders around this country uh, look like they should never run for office in the first place. But he is going to have to tackle somewhere between a 15 to $20 billion deficit. Now, what's going to make Governor Cuomo's job harder than mine is that he'll be cutting places that have been vanquished anyway, like the healthcare industry, the education. So I think that he is the best person to be in that position at the same time. And I wouldn't even try to advise him because this pandemic has created an economic crisis far beyond the one that I had to address years ago. Before I let you go, you end your book, and I won't give any spoilers, but you end your book by saying that um, at least one person has a, had approached you in the past and urged you to run for mayor of New York City in 2017 and 2021. And then you end the book with your the words, the end, with a question mark. And I'm wondering, <laughs> you have this book coming out. Do you see uh, yourself going back into politics? What's next for you? I don't, but when I first got into politics, I never saw myself getting into politics. And I wouldn't totally rule out anything, but what I would say is what I really would rather be is that leadership that comes after you served where those who are in office who face tough situations, that you can use your history and experience to remind them uh, of what they might want to pay attention to as they move forward. And that's partly why I wrote the book as well. Yeah, and you can find some of that history and experience in your book, of course. Uh, Governor David Patterson, thanks so much for joining us here on New York Now this week. Well, thank you, Dan. It's good to see you again.